This is everyday use part two. We are starting off at paragraph 55 on page six. After dinner, D. Wangero went to the trunk at the foot of my bed and started rifling through it. Maggie hung back in the kitchen over the dishpan. Out came Wangero with two quilts. They had been pieced by Grandma D. and then Big D and me had hung them on the quilt frames on the front porch and quilted them. One was in Lone Star pattern. The other was Walk Around the Mountain. And both of them were scraps of dresses Grandma D had worn fifty or more years ago, bits and pieces of Grandpa Gerald's paisley shirts, and one teeny faded blue piece about the size of a penny matchbox that was from Great Grandpa Ezra's uniform that he wore in the Civil War. Mama, Wangero said, sweet as a bird, can I have these old quilts? I heard something fall in the kitchen, and a minute later the kitchen door slammed. Why don't you take one or two of the others? I asked. These old things was just done by me and Big D for some tops of your grandma piece before she died. No, Wangero said, I don't want those. They are stitched around the borders by machine. That'll make them last better, I said. That's not the point, said Wangero. These are all pieces of dresses grandma used to wear. She did all this stitching by hand. Imagine! She held the quilt securely in her arms, stroking them. Some of the pieces, like those lavender ones, came from old clothes her mother handed down to her. I said, moving up to touch the quilts. D. Wangero moved back just enough so that I couldn't reach the quilts. They already belonged to her. Imagine, she breathed again, touching them closely to her bosom. The truth is, I said, I promised to give them quilts to Maggie for when she marries John Thomas. She gasped like a bee had stung her. Maggie can't appreciate these quilts, she said. She'd probably be backward enough to put them to everyday use. I reckon she would, I said. God knows I've been saving them for long enough and nobody using them. I hope she will. I don't want to bring up how I had offered D. Wangero a quilt when she went away to college. Then she had told me that they were old-fashioned, out of style. But they're priceless, she was saying now, furiously, for she had a, for she has a temper. Maggie will put them on the bed in five years they'll be in rags. Less than that. She can always make more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. D. Wangero looked at me with hatred. You just will not understand. The point is these quilts, these quilts. Well, I said, stumped, what would you do with them? Hang them, she said, as if that was the only thing you could do with quilts. Maggie by now was standing in the door. I could almost hear the sound her feet made as they scraped over each other. She can have them, Mama, she said, like somebody used to never like somebody used to never winning anything or having anything reserved for her. I can't remember gr Grandma D without the quilts. I looked at her hard. She had filled her bottom lip with ch checkerberry snuff and gave it and it gave her face a kind of dopey hang 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 dog look. It was Grandma D and Big D who taught her how to quilt herself. She stood there with her scarred hands hidden in the folds of her skirt. She looked at her sister with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. When I looked at her like that, something hit me in the top of my head and ran down to the soles of my feet. Just like when I'm in church and the Spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout, I did something I never had done before. Hugged Maggie to me, then dragged her on into the room, snatched the quilts out of Miss Wangero's hands, and dumped them into Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on my bed with her mouth open. Take one or two of the others, I said to Dee. But she turned without a word and went to Hakima Barber. You don't understand, she said, as Maggie and I came out of the car. What don't I understand? I wanted to know. Your heritage, she said. And then she turned to Maggie, kissed her, and said, You ought to try to make something of yourself too, Maggie. It's really a new day for us. But from the way you and Mama still live, you never know it. She put on some sunglasses that hid everything above the tip of her nose and chin. Maggie smiled. Maybe at the sunglasses, but a real smile, not scared. After we watched the car dust settle, I asked Maggie to bring me a dip of snuff. And then the two of us sat there just enjoying until it was time to go in the house and go to bed. Okay, we're now going to do our text-dependent questions. This one is a little bit lengthier where there are seven text-dependent questions. So let's go ahead and start with number one, part A. Which of the following best identifies the main theme of the text? A. Sometimes adopting a new heritage can result in the rejection of a person's true heritage and family history. B. A person must understand their family history before they can truly understand themselves. C. The modern, the modern world often demands that people change whether they want to or not. D. Physical objects can often offer people a connection to their family history and family members who have passed. 
think about for this question what continuously is coming up, okay? Don't push for something that's not there. Question two, part B. Which detail from the text best supports the answer to part A? A. Pressed us to her with a serious way she read to shove us away at just the moment like dimwits we seemed about to understand. Paragraph 10. B. You didn't even have to look close to see where hands pushing the dasher up and down to make butter had left to kind of sink in the wood. Paragraph 54. C. These are all pieces of grandma's dr pieces of dresses grandma used to wear. She did all this stitching by hand. Imagine. Paragraph 62. D. I didn't want to bring up how I offered D. Wangero a quilt when she went away to college. Then she had told me they were old-fashioned, out of style. Paragraph 69. Question 3, Part A. What prompts the narrator? Remember, that our narrator is someone who is telling the story. So, again, what prompts the narrator to refuse to give D the quilt she wants? A. She knows that D doesn't want the quilts to remember her grandmother. B. She realizes that she has been neglecting Maggie. C. She is tired of being pushed around by D. D. She realizes that Maggie never gets what she deserves. Question 4, Part B. Which section from the text best supports the answer to Part A? A. She had filled her bottom lip, lip with checkerberry snuff and it gave her a face a kind of dopey hangdog look. B. She looked at her sister with... She looked at her sister with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. C. When I looked at her like that, something hit me in the top of my head and ran down to the soles of my feet. D. I did something I never had done before. Hugged Maggie to me, then dragged her into dragged her on into the room. Pair, uh, question five. You're going to see that it refers back to paragraph 14. Reread paragraph 14 before moving on to this question. What does the phrase, the scalding humor that erupted like bubbles and lies, suggest about D? A. Her sense of humor is hurtful. B. She has a boring sense of humor. C. She often, she doesn't often show her funny side. D. Her sense of humor is difficult to understand. If you do not know what lie is, Google it. Use your resources during this time. It is okay to Google things if you need to know what it is. Question six and seven are a short answer. Again, you will need to include textual evidence in these questions. Question six, how does the following passage contribute to readers' understanding of Maggie? Aunt Dee's first husband whittled the dash, said Maggie so low you, could, you almost couldn't hear her. His name was Henry, but they called him Stash. Paragraph 52. Seven, how does Dee's perspective on the family's possessions compare to the rest of her families? Okay, now for, remember for the discussion questions, you have three options. You only need to pick two to do it. Just a reminder, you may do this on EdSight. You only need to do the two on EdSight or you may do them on paper. Question one, do you think D is being true to her, her, I'm sorry, true to her heritage? Why or why not? Question two, in the context of the text, what makes a family? Why do you think mama is closer with Maggie than she is with D? What is important in order to keep a family close? Cite examples from the text, your own experience in other literature, art, or history in your answer. I just want to emphasize, again, you can have your own experience with this one. The discussion questions are a little more informal, so you don't need to use textual evidence like you would and maybe the short answer for the text-dependent questions. Question three, in the context of the text, can you change your identity? How important is a person's heritage to their identity? Do you think your heritage is something you can control or alter? Remember, alter is to change. Why or why not? This one, I can already begin to think um, about the True Diary of Part-Time Indian, how we read that in the second quarter. So think about identity and heritage and how those connect. Good luck. Let me know if you have any questions. Again... Everyday use, you may answer the questions with this code at EdSight. If you have questions, email me at this email or reach out to my Google Voice number if you'd like a more immediate response. Good luck and let me know if you have questions.